Welcome to Yahoo Finance Uncut. I am your host, Jared Blickery. Today with me is a very special guest, Dr. David Roiney. He is a surgeon, entrepreneur, and financial literary enthusiast. And uh, I, I do want to begin, David, uh, Dr. Dave, as I'd like to call you here. We're going to get into uh, your journey as a robotic surgeon in a second, but we got to talk about the markets here. Um, this is a tape presentation, so this is in the rearview mirror, but we're going to talk about some of the bigger picture issues and what a week it has been because we have seen crypto just fall apart. We've seen the bankruptcy of FTX this morning. We have uh, Sam Bankman freed on a, on a tweet fest here and Twitter is owned by Elon Musk. So where to start? You are an amateur investor, um, but you study the markets. You follow them quite closely and you pose a number of interesting questions on Twitter. I'm just wondering what's, what's your view of what's going on right now, Dave? Well, I mean, it's absolute. First off, thanks for uh, having me here. Uh, never really thought that I'd ever be on this show. I've watched it on <laughs> online uh, a bit. I, you know, it's quite interesting. I mean, the thing about learning about markets is I, I try and start from like the beginning of things and learn like how everything is supposed to work and then come up with my own inferences of like where we are today. I mean, the reality is, is over time, your sort of opinion about crypto or whatever has to change as you get more information because it's not that old. Now, the what has gone on recently is basically you see that these large players, if they collapse, the entire market falls with it. I do find it interesting that Ethereum and Bitcoin have been pretty resilient, which leads to me like there might actually be a utility of those two. <laughs> Which is funny, right? Because I think of Ethereum as more of a, everyone says it's not a company, but I think it's a company that just provides a service. So that service is represented by ETH. And so that does, to me, have some value. Now, granted, I'm not an investor in ETH, but it's something that I, now I'm like curious about. Bitcoin, I think, has already been labeled a commodity but I mean, it's not going to zero. It's proved that it's not going to zero. Ethereum's proved it's not going to zero. There are other things that have proved that will go to zero. But those two seem to be very interesting. And I'm surprised that they, if they truly were like, as people like to call it online, Ponzinomics or Ponzi schemes, you would think they would drop to zero and they're just not dropping to zero. No. In fact, I have the Wi-Fi Interactive hooked up to our presentation here, and I'm going to share our heat map on cryptocurrencies. This goes back five days. Let's make this seven days, and we can see Bitcoin now down 21%. Share has shed over a fifth of its value. So has Ethereum. Uh, and then you take a, a look at what's happened. Uh, well, poor ApeCoin down at the bottom. I think that was already toast. Uh, but FTT, that was supposed to be a stable coin. Uh, that's down about 90%, almost 90%. Solana down 56%. David, you said something interesting that you're kind of being uh, led to believe now that crypto, at least Ethereum and, and Bitcoin, might have some actual utility here, might have a purpose. I'm wondering if you didn't think that before, um, was that keeping you away from investment? Are you more open to it now? Maybe when the dust settles, just wondering what you're thinking there is as an investor. Well, as an investor, I feel like anything you put your money into, you got to actually understand what's going on. I read the Satoshi White Paper, I think back in like 2010, 2011, right? Um, and so the math of it makes sense to me based on my, my background in applied mathematics. It, it had a great concept to it. Um, I talked myself out of doing Bitcoin mining. I've I gone down that path several times because I just thought it was interesting. I'm a you can pretty much call me a, a athletic geek, right? And, or athletic nerd. And I, I like that stuff. Right. Um, so over time, my mentality about cryptocurrency has changed quite a bit because it was something that was uh, piqued my curiosity. And then I sort of let it go away. And then I came back to it during, uh, obviously during the pandemic when you don't really have a lot extra to do. So you're just looking around at different things and I was learning as much as I can. So I read a lot of these different coin white papers and really tried to learn the ecosystem because I didn't want to adopt someone else's thinking on the subject. And at first I could not really understand like from a global sort of standpoint of like, okay, so Bitcoin's here, everyone's saying it has some value, but what, 
is the value? Like, what is the thing that I get in return? I've, obviously, we know it's not a dividend, right? We know that I'm not looking at fundamentals of Bitcoin. Can't um, you can't eat it, right? You can't live under it. So like, what is the value? It's not store of value, right? Because we know that it was supposed to be or pitched as an inflation head. We know it doesn't work that way. It kind of functions almost like a tech stock in that as soon as people go risk off on their uh, investing assets, they like Bitcoin sort of crashes and crypto follows with it. So I didn't really understand that aspect. Now, there's a whole component of the Lightning Network and being able to provide uh, sort of payment transfers and remittances like worldwide that I think that does have some utility. I think the underlying um, function for that, that core function actually provides some utility. And that probably is what provides the value in Bitcoin, in my opinion. Right. Um, same thing with Ethereum. Ethereum is something completely different. And I've gone back and forth with it because, you know, I look at it and I go, OK, you know, it's more of like a think of it as like the AWS is what it's been described hmm. upon. And I've like some days I'm like, yeah, I can see it. Some days I can't. Now I can see it a little bit more. It's right. Because like even if the coins that are the tokens that are built on top of Ethereum, like if those don't truly have any utility, well, Ethereum has already proved this use case. Its job is to create other applications on top of it. So I'm like, okay, now I see the point of it, right? Like it is supposed to be the infrastructure that other people can build off of. Given those two things, I'm like, okay, now I can see the use case for those. The other one that I tend to just pay uh, attention to is Cardano. And again, that is something that I believed in early on because I, I, they took a very slow approach. It's mathematically based, it's research based, but I mean, it, it hasn't done great at all. Right. And it went up just like the rest of cryptocurrency when everyone was speculating and it's come crashing down. But I still think that has a potential to actually do something because they focus on sort of developing and emerging markets to provide like a payment infrastructure in places that typically have corrupt sort of financial systems. So I I do think that will have sort of its day to prove if it's going to be something. But I didn't, I was going back and forth between Solana and Cardano and it's something about Solana never sat well with me. So I, I put my money into Cardano. Right. But I also won't put anything in these risky assets that I'm not afraid to go to zero. And that's kind of like my risk management is like it's like giving away money. Right. So like once I make that investment, I don't intend to sell anytime soon. So like I have to be okay with not getting that money back. And that's how I view cryptocurrency. If you are intending to get a short term return, uh, a return in next year, then don't put your money there. I, I think those are very wise words, and I'm really appreciating your perspective uh, of this investment and also just kind of growing up through the pandemic uh, to a lot of new asset classes. My eyes were, were peeled back by the meme stock craze. Uh, I know you had some opinions about that back in the day, but I want to share the screen here one more time. I have a number of tweets. Um, I encourage everybody to follow you. It's at Phi Sergi, um, and you go by the name Sergify here. Let's see. Yeah, we can see it on the screen. A crypto exchange should not be backed by its own token. I think that should be rule number one. I mean, even drug do- dealers have a rule of not getting high on their own supply. Clever, um, and I think very, very true, because we have a system of leverage here. You have all this leverage that's been built into crypto, but not a lot of transparency. And now that the lights are shining, we know it happens on in a dark movie theater when you put the lights on. Sometimes you see some creepy crawlies come out at you. And I think that's um, what we're seeing right now. And then you ask another question here, which I think is very important. How many pensions endowments are hurt by this FTX collapse? And I'm just wondering, what goes through your head? Are you questioning the systemic uh, nature of this? Are you questioning, uh, are you thinking in terms of investors who are who may, be, have, may have been subjected to this? What's your thinking when you ask questions like this? Look, I, every time I think about this stuff is who can get hurt, right? Because there are people in the financial system that don't have a voice, right? Like, uh, for instance, the Ontario teacher's pension was invested in FTX, right? Those are everyday people. And how many of them actually know, like the teachers who retired, who are collecting a pension, actually know that their money was tied up in this sort of FTX collapse. Now, my, like, 
granted, a lot of people have said, you know, when people or these funds put money into these investments, it's only a small portion. It doesn't matter. Right. I think we get lost in the fact that this was still a very risky asset. Right. That are very risky investment. And they're going to essentially mark their entire investment to zero because they're not getting anything back. Right. Um, there's moms, pops, your sisters, your brothers, your aunts, your uncles. There are everyday people who get hurt. And I think we forget about it. And people, I think, in finance who are running big books of business and have like lots of AUM, they forget that every day that there's a person that has to live their life and they can be wiped out by your bad decision making. And let's get let's talk about financial literacy. This is something you uh, tweet a lot about that you have a lot of concerns just in general. I'm not even talking about crypto now because that's its own animal. But in general, in the United States, we have a rather broken process, uh, as I think you would agree, to financial literacy. Um, how do you see I, I think we know some of the problems. Maybe you could just kind of spell them out the way you see them and what you see as potential solutions or at least questions to get us on the right track. Well, financial literacy is an interesting topic, right? Like I've tweeted about this. I've uh, done, went through SSRN and looked for as many papers as I could that talked about financial literacy. One, there's no standard definition of what constitutes financial literacy in the world, let alone in the United States, right? Um, so given that, we don't know what actually it means to be financial literate. And then we find that, you know, there are pockets that are at the lower income uh, sort of threshold economic scale, and then at the higher economic scale, that people just don't understand money, right? But I would argue that people like to throw the term financial literacy around, not necessarily because they want to uh, sort of fix the system. They want to use that as a talking point, as a way to sort of like justify what they're doing. The reality is, is like there's a whole lot of nothing being done about financial literacy, but there's a lot of people claiming that they're trying to improve financial literacy. I do think that financial literacy needs to be like an all-encompassing thing where it's your everyday scenarios that, hey, I'm 22 years old, I just got a new job, but I don't know how much I'm supposed to be able to spend on an apartment or how much do I need to pay for a car? How do I get a car loan? Like these things are important. And like for me, there was nobody teaching me how to do this stuff. I just sort of had to learn it along the way. And I made a lot of bad mistakes along the way. Right. And so we have to get to a point in our society that we could teach people like how to manage their money correctly. Now, financial literacy is not fixing poverty at all. Right. It's not fixing the fact that um, people need to make more and that wages have not increased, like improved with inflation over time, have not kept up with inflation. It's not fixing any of that. And financial literacy doesn't put money in people's pockets. Now, it can make you more efficient with your money, but you still have to have money in order to actually start to improve your life. That's just my two cents. Let me uh, put something else on the screen here. Uh, this is from you, and it says, you are the world's best return on investment. Uh, I can take this a number of ways that uh, I should be investing in myself. How do you, how, what does this mean to you? I mean, the reality is, no matter how hard my life has been to get to where I am today, and I had to go through a number of obstacles to get there. Like someone, there was always someone who said, you know what, I'm going to do something for free for him, right? In order to like get me through that next hump, right? They, it was either time, which is time is everyone's greatest asset. So they donated their time. They spent like spent that asset on me. And then in return, my productivity or my accomplishment was their return on investment. Whether it is investing in yourself, whether that's going to get an additional degree or investing in other people where you have the ability to reach back and actually provide some means and open a door, that's the world's best return on investment. The reality is you don't know what the person next to you or the person coming after you can accomplish unless you give them the opportunity. So provide yourself that opportunity as well as provide others that opportunity and we actually will be better off. I really love that. And can we talk about some of those opportunities that um, 
you may have been able to benefit from and some of the uh, incredible adversity that you were able to overcome as a child growing up in poverty. And uh, I'll let you fill in the details there, please. I, at the end of the day, like I am still the kid that moved a thousand times basically in my head, which is close to 30, right? Where we were basically trying to find where my mom could maintain some semblance of work. She went in and out of the hospital, God rest her soul. She died young, right? But I honestly think my mom was the most successful person in the world. She raised a son, my older brother, who uh, had a great career in the military and is now a network engineer, right? She raised a doctor who uh, also happened to be a uh, college basketball player and a college track athlete um, who also went to a unique, uh, a elite used institution in the United States Naval Academy. And we did it from being dirt poor. At one point, we were living in a car. I mean, I remember I can still taste right now, if I think about it, the, the backseat of that car, as well as the Burger King that we ate for every meal because it was two for one Whoppers. And that was the only thing that we could afford. And then a Whopper was big and we can cut it up and we can eat that all day. And you eat these cold, nasty Whoppers with uh, like stale lettuce and like soggy lettuce and soggy buns. And I can still like get the nausea in my fit, like gut because I can still have that visceral feeling. I will never forget where I came from. I will never forget not having to steal electricity as a kid because we didn't have the lights uh, turn on or having to uh, light the pilot light uh, every time we could to sort of keep the uh, stove the oven down so we can warm our house up. I, I remember all of it. I remember sleeping on the floor. I remember all of it. That's never going to go away from me, right? We all have our adversity, and I can't be upset with the adversity that I went through because someone had it worse. I just kept realizing that along the way that I couldn't look back, right? There was no one coming to save me, and that at every turn, like, if I failed, that was it for me. I was back to square one. And you were able to parlay that by succeeding and, and also be able to become a robotic surgeon. Can you share with us how that came about and some of the struggles that you went through and then kind of how you've emerged on the other side as uh, much more financially stable than I would say you were definitely in your childhood. Uh, but how have you been able to leverage that your career uh, into where you are now? I, it was accidental because God knows that I wasn't the one like at every turn, I was trying to talk myself out of doing something, right? Um, whether it was going to the Naval Academy, I was trying to talk myself out of doing that. I knew it would help me, but I also knew that I was leaving for good. I was leaving California for good, and I wasn't turning back. So then I get to the Academy, and then I'm not going to say it was the most rosy uh, sort of welcome because I was a kid that was – Grew up in Compton and Long Beach, and I didn't look like anybody else. I didn't talk like anybody else, and I sure didn't act like anybody else. And they were more refined than me, whatever you want to call it. And I dealt with a lot of discrimination. And I had to tell them, like, hey, I'm not going anywhere. So then I had to evolve and learn how to survive in that. And then I made it out of the academy, and I'm making some money, but it really wasn't anything, right? And I, along the way, I had a coach who happened to be a financial advisor for Primerica, and he sort of forced me to come to grips with that. I didn't understand how to manage money. And so I'm starting to learn that I could learn things at the Naval Academy. And over time, I just got more and more curious because I wanted to know where that money was going. And then the fire got lit underneath me when my coach was no longer working for Primerica and a great financial crisis happened, right? And I'm trying to figure out why my money's going down. And it turns out I was in a bunch of mutual funds that were closed-ended and I couldn't put any more money in, right? Mm -hmm. So the only things I knew about was compound interest and the rule of 72. So I was like, well, let me just put more money in and I couldn't. So then I asked, could I talk to a financial advisor? And I basically got uh, my, their, they shut the door on me. Basically they turned their back on me and said, Hey, you know what? You don't make enough money. And here I was, I was making more money than my mom ever made in her life. And I was like, you know, that doesn't make any sense to me. So I asked, well, what's a financial advisor to start with? And they told me with the, who they were. And then I asked, well, what do they read? 
And so they told me some things and they told me to start with the prospectus from some of the funds. And I try, I read it Good cover luck. to cover. Wow. And it was, it was all jargon. I had to yes. like, at the time, I think it was like uh, Ash Jeeves or something crazy as far as the, the search engine. But I, I would search all these terms and have to look up things constantly. And I didn't understand any of it. So then slowly but surely, like I started teaching myself more and more and more. And like, I'm determined to make sure that nobody else has to do that. Right. And all that adversity basically just sort of lit me down a path that, Hey, you know, I know that in order to be successful, I have to create something that I didn't have before. Right. And each step along the way, there was something new that stepped in, whether it was, Hey, uh, I got married and we're having our, uh, another kid. And I'm just like, Oh my God, I'm a surgical resident. How the heck am I supposed to afford this? And then that forced me to reevaluate things again. And so I've just continually tried to improve, continually try to evolve to my understanding. And I never let any adversity get to me. I let myself feel the anger and the emotion of it. And then I move on from it. And I say, you know what, I'm going to make a plan and just move on. And that's how I've dealt with all of it. That, that's an amazing attitude uh, and story as well. What would you, what do you want to see out of a financial advisor who's sitting down with somebody who may not be quite as driven or, as you or be able to spend the time and resources to read the entire prospectus and try to dig through and, and, and go through all the self-education? There should be solutions for this, and, and maybe there are already. What do you like to see and what would you like to hear from a financial advisor who's sitting down with somebody for the first time who may not have a tremendous amount of money? The first thing is financial advice needs to be more affordable. Financial planning, financial advisement, um, financial investment advice, whatever you want to call it, it is geared toward Henry's high earning, high earners, not rich yet, right? Mm -hmm. Or your ultra high net worth, your people who are more well off, right? And the economics of that industry don't pretend well to people who make less than $80,000. And if you talk to financial advisors, they're going to say, well, you know, people at the lower end of the economic scale don't really need much. They just need budgeting advice, some generic investment advice. And they feel like it's not worth their time because they need to get paid money. Right. And I get that. It's a business. But the reality is, is the people who really, truly need the advice are at the lower end of the scale. Right. It, at the end of the day, if you have a high, ultra high net worth individual if they lose a little bit of money, it's not going to hurt them. However, if a person at the, at the lower end of the scale puts their money in the wrong investment and they lose $20,000, that might be their life savings, right? That, that impact is heavy. And I get it. What I want to see from the financial industry is more pro bono work and actually get, a, get out there to try and make a difference. Treat everyone like they're your family. Grow up with that person. If I get pitched a lot of stuff on LinkedIn from advisors now trying to gain, because they, they see that I, it says surgeon next to my name or whatever, and yes. they're trying to find out if I have a financial advisor. The reality is the time to have worked with me was when I graduated from the Naval Academy and I was just getting started in my career. But they don't, a lot of people just don't see that because I don't make them money. And that's the reality. And that's how it is. Young professionals don't tend to make people money in the financial industry if they're not earning a lot of money. And that's just the reality. There's a lot of people in this country who are locked out of financial advice. So I would like to see we either make that advice uh, free, right, where they can go learn it themselves. And there are resources, Investopedia, Investor.gov, but they, they have their own thing. They don't, those same resources don't cater to people who are at the lower end of the scale. They don't find out about it. And that's just a reality. Yeah, back in, uh, back decades ago, home economics, more of a thing in school, you would have people uh, not necessarily doing the, uh, the nuts and bolts of economic, but you know, they'll learn to cook, they'll learn how to balance their budget in the house. Um, I'm thinking the education system probably coming up quite short here, especially with regard to the lower end of the income range here. Um, what about kind of a reboot on home economics in the education system where 
things like this are addressed. Um, how to set up a brokerage account and how to uh, not get fleeced uh, by the latest crypto craze or whatever, or how to uh, invest prudently for the future, um, how to set aside money for a family or budget for a family. I'm just wondering if any of this resonates with you. All of it resonates with me, right? Because the reality is, is we know in the U.S. we had what the hour of code initiative. So we know these things can be done. We can carve out time to do initiatives that are truly sort of relevant to where we want society to go. If we want people to get better with their money, we need to actually make an effort to teach them. Right. Teach the teachers. Right. They spend more time with our kids than pretty much a lot of parents. Right. Because if you think about it, eight hours in school and then your kids get home, you get home from uh, work or whatever, you eat dinner, you have a couple hours, and then you're going to sleep. The bulk of your time during the school year is not spent with your kids during the day. It's the teachers, okay? Now, take an hour and teach them these things. Teach them what taxes are. How does our tax system work? How do you necessarily, you don't need to necessarily balance a checkbook these days because a lot of people don't write checks, but how do you budget? right? What's an index fund? How does the stock market work? And then get away from things like thinking that the stock market game is a way to teach financial literacy. That is not a way to teach people financial literacy. We want to get people away from trading and becoming more of an investor, okay? Like those are things that we can help people out with. Those are things that we can help them understand. There's a lot of concepts out there. What's a mortgage? Why is a mortgage important? What's bonds? What's uh, mutual funds? What's an ETF? These are things that they can start to learn. And we can start to teach kids financial concepts. It's been shown through sort of the literature that you can start to teach them financial concepts at the age of three, right? If they're able to learn relatively addition and subtraction, like easy math, they can learn financial concepts. You know, it's interesting. You, you mentioned a checkbook and the, the, that we really don't use those anymore. Something to be said by the forward-looking nature uh, that it kind of forced you to do that that check was going to come due rather than be subtracted from your account instantaneously, which is what we've been accustomed to. And there just doesn't seem to be that much planning uh, going on. And I want to use this as segue. I want to show uh, on the screen here, we have uh, uh, David, Dr. Roiney, staff surgeon, U.S. Navy. And this is the SEC roundtable, which you were recently uh, admitted to. And I just want to go scroll up to the top here. Uh, this is an investor advisory committee. And I'm just wondering, you joined this uh, several months ago, earlier in the year. What has come of this so far? I mean, so far, it's been a huge learning curve for me, right? I mean, the reality, if you go down the list, I'm the only one who doesn't work in finance on a day, daily basis or not a lawyer, right? And so even with uh, my colleagues on the uh, committee, there's a lot of jargon that gets said. So I spend a lot of time looking up things. And so I try and make sure I work hard enough to bring my knowledge level up, like closer to where they are, but I'm never going to get to the point that they are right. I can only hope to bring a different perspective on things because I do have a varied background and I do see things from a different perspective. I also grew up differently than a lot of people on the committee. So my thing is I want to try and bring sort of the everyday voice and the everyday concern while also bringing an educated point of view that is different from sort of the echo chamber that exists in finance. I'm just wondering if you can say at all, uh, if you can't, uh, don't hesitate to pan the question, but who's at these meetings, who's listening, and who seems to be paying attention really to what uh, you're saying and what the other members are saying? Um, I mean, the when we have a committee meeting, uh, that, that's in public record, right? So like everyone can hear and, and read later what was said during a meeting because there's a transcript. The biggest thing is those meetings are open to the public. All the uh, SEC commissioners are there. Uh, their staffs are there. And then you have uh, Chairman Ginsler, who's there as well, who's listening in on what happens. Um, I have I was lucky that I happened to um, come across Commissioner Purse, uh, Hester Purse, before uh, I even was asked to apply to the Investor Advisory Committee 
And I just had an offline conversation. So I was able to get some advice from her and she has sort of encouraged me to make sure that I am bringing a different point of view that I can sort of bring a different sort of lens to how things go. Right. Cause I've had this varied background, which spans multiple industries. Maybe I can bring a different type of perspective to the committee. Well, I would say they need a lot of help right now, especially sorting out, and I'm going to put crypto aside, I would say just in general, um, there's a lot to be sorted out in these markets. Um, sticking with the markets here, and given your expertise as a surgeon and all your medical training, I'm wondering if any of that has uh, informed some of your decisions with respect to maybe biotech stocks, and you don't have to name names here, but any technologies or things that you have invested in based on uh, the knowledge and training that you have? Personally, I, I stay away from biotech. Personally, I stay away from farm, farm, uh, pharma companies, biotech, medical technology. One, the medical technology stuff I stay away from because as a surgeon, I don't ever want my sort of uh, decision making to even be questioned and whether or not it's biased and why I'm using a product. Right. So I don't want to have to disclose or anything like that that even brings up the possibility that I am putting an implant in or anything like that because I'm an investor in a company. Like I don't ever want to be in that situation because I think patients deserve to have a, um, like a unbiased opinion and they need to always know that their surgeon, their doctor is doing the right thing for them at the right time and utilizing the right sort of uh, implant tool, whatever. It can't be based on money. Integrity. So that's yeah. one thing. It has to, your integrity has to be without question. The next thing is there are technologies that I am fond of, and there's technologies that I think we as a whole, I think personally, should not go down that path, right? Because we truly, they're so cutting edge that we don't really know what the true ramification of what we're doing is going to be. And that's just my personal opinion. But we have to understand medicine is unique and healthcare is unique in the fact that it takes a long period of time. Typically, it's about 10 years before something gets adopted and becomes sort of just starting to get into medical practice, right? I'm a, a robotic surgeon. I utilize the Intuitive DaVinci plat XI platform to do a lot of my surgeries. And I think it's phenomenal. But like they've been working on that for years, right? That's been at least two decades worth of like iteration. And so the next company coming up that's going to be the next wave They've been probably starting on that in the 2010s, right? And so we won't see them really start to gain any type of market share until like 2025, 2030, before things really start to change. And so people always ask me, well, are you invested in intuitive? The answer is obviously no, I'm not, right? Because I don't want a biased opinion. The other thing is like, I don't 100% believe that they're going to be able to maintain their market share going forward. I'm wondering, with your window, your unique window into uh, the future of medical technology here, what does it look like? I'm not even talking about from an investment point of view. What do you think medicine, uh, surgery, just the technologies that have evolved, are, are they going to allow us to do in five, 10 years that we haven't been able to now? Because it seems like we're the, in the midst of a real explosion of technology, kind of too, uh, comparable to the way the internet came about about 30 years ago. Well, we're at the point where... If you talk about 20 years ago, even at the beginning of when I started training in 2014, right, where people were more likely to make a bigger incision by small incisions and use cameras. OK, so this trend of using smaller and smaller instruments and being minimally invasive is, is going to just rapidly take off. And it, I, we're still at the beginning of it, in my opinion, because we can make the instruments smaller. Now, durability of those instruments are, and because they're so rigid, like you have to worry about that, the smaller in, in the incision you make. But I think people are going to find ways to improve the optics, improve the instruments being used, because those instruments haven't really improved over time. But as we go forward, there's going to be less and less people who want to actually have longer stays in the hospital. So the more minimally invasive surgery or minimally invasive procedure you can offer, people are going to want that. And we already see those things occurring in cardiology. We see those things occurring in vascular surgery. We see those things occurring in even heart transplants, kidney transplants. People want the ability to get through these bigger operations with smaller incisions. And I only think that development and sort of that innovation is going to continue.
As we go forward, we know that people are very concerned with aging, right? Um, the thing in the literature which says that aging uh, sort of you can increase your longevity is by caloric restriction. However, people are more concerned with as they get older, they don't want to look older, they don't want to feel older, and they want to live longer. So I think that is going to be another area where people are really going to put in a lot of investment. And I think that can be a double-edged sword, right? Because if you do the wrong things, it can be very harmful. And if we invest in the wrong things, it can be very harmful. But those are other things that people want, right? They want the ability to see their the multiple generations after them come. And they want to see and sort of stick around this earth for a longer period of time. Yeah, I have. Uh, I come from Miami. I, I lived there for several decades. Grew up there, so I know that the 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 quest for anti aging technologies and down there it was typically a scalpel, just because that's all all that we've had. Plastic surgery is what I'm talking about. But yeah, I got to think that going forward, uh, money is going to win the day too, because the billionaires, uh, all that money is good, not good for them once they're dead, obviously. And so prolonging their own lives, I think, would get top billing. And I think it's underappreciated how how powerful that drive is going to be and how uh, you know, we talk about the wealth disparity right now, uh, that could only increase as people with more wealth simply don't have to or are postponing their death and not leaving it to future generations, which is taxed. Um, I think it gives the opportunity to really hoard a lot of wealth. And that's probably um, on the back burner, at least in my mind as well. All right, that's my little soliloquy there. But I want to branch out into some other spaces where you're doing some deep thinking um, and also in healthcare, just because you work in healthcare. Let's do this uh, right now. Lots of things broken. Uh, it's been a hot mess in this country for a long time. Are we on the right track? Uh, where are areas where we could improve just in general? I mean, that's like I, I could spend a full day talking about things. It's that, very general and just one or two examples, maybe your so pet peeves. Per, right now, we have a consolidation of healthcare. right? Healthcare is massively inefficient between you have insurance companies, which are incentivized not to pay out the first time around. Right. Because. These days, and Warren, I mean, Warren Buffett loves insurance companies because they have float, right? They get yes. up front. Underappreciated, uh, yeah. Like it's completely underappreciated in the insurance industry on how much money these companies actually make. We know that over the grand scheme of things, the way it works is that the healthies tend to subsidize people who need to go to the um, hospital more and utilize the system more. But that float, is a big driver of insurance company profit, right? Because they can go and leverage that float up, they can invest it, things of that sort, and they can gain a return on it. And all it is is basically being able to make money on top of money, right? So there's that aspect. And then you have the hospital aspect, which is getting more and more complex and more and more specialized. And I call it the hospital industrial complex where I like it. it's becoming more big business and you have these sort of consolidations of healthcare where it used to have a lot of price competitive, like competition, right? But now that more and more healthcare institutions are becoming vertically integrated, where they own the pre-hospital stay, the uh, hospital stay, the post-hospital stay, that entire uh, spectrum, in addition to the insurance company, the medical school, all the training pipelines, like they control their pricing. And eventually they're going to get to the point where they're going to say, well, you know what, why do I need to worry about an insurance company? I'll just... I'll offer you my own insurance company or insurance plan. And we see this is happening, right? At UMPC, uh, Kaiser Permanente, right? These big institutions are saying, you know what? I'll go buy as basically the entire area. And they've become essentially monopolies in certain areas of the country. And there's no competition to it. Not only that, is they're consolidating their efforts to decrease the amount of money that they're spending and they're leaving rural America in the dust. And so healthcare has got to have a reckoning at some point. We've gotten to the point where the technology, it's hard to really debate on whether or not you can have a new electronic health record company come in because it's so prohibitive, the bigger these hospital systems get on actually making a change in their EHR. Epic Systems, Cerner Corporation, these companies have a large lion's share, roughly over two thirds of the EHR offerings in the country. 
but you can't switch. It's going to be impossible for a large hospital system to basically say, you know what, on Monday, we're going to be epic. The next day, we're going to be Cerner. It's impossible for that to occur because the friction and the hurdle that you have to get over is too great of a charge for them to do it. Not only that, you have to do training, right? You, there's a lot of aspects that healthcare has essentially become so big that it's going to start to stumble on itself. And yes. some things have to change. Do you see uh, disruption? Well, okay, so it's going to stumble. Disruption putatively would be on the horizon. What does that look like? I mean, it's just like finance, right? It has to unbundle, right? Mm -hmm. It bundled up so much that eventually patients are going to get pissed off and say, you know what? I'm going to want a piecemeal service just so I can afford this, right? Like we've uh, bundled healthcare so much. More expensive. That's so ironic. Yeah, I, I mean, think about it. it. It's already starting to happen. We have urgent cares that have blown, like completely gone out of the out of the water as far as how many have popped up. I mean, in certain areas, you can probably find at least five urgent cares within a five mile radius, right? That's insane. Our urgent care is essentially just a fast track, meaning um, you're not really sick enough to be in a full ER, but you need some help and you can go home the same day as what they believe based upon the triage. And they unbundled that. Right. The same thing with you have uh, ambulatory surgical centers, which unbundled the need to have someone take up a full resource of a hospital or you have a 23 hour ER. Right. Which can pro provide a short hospital like stay where you're just being observed for 23 hours. Right. The, it's going to continue to unbundle in the most profitable areas where people are using it the most. Majority of ERs are not necessarily getting people admitted. It's literally a lot of people in this country use the ER as a primary care type service. Right. So if you unbundle that aspect, you're gaining a lot of patients right off the bat because they just need onesie twosies type thing, medication refills. Hey, I have a cold. Can I, and it's been seven days. Can you prescribe me some antibiotics? Hey, I cut my hand. I just need a couple sutures and they don't need the markup associated with the hospital. It's more affordable and you're going to continually see this. Right. And so the hospital is going to have to make a choice. Well, if more and more people don't want to pay the full price of being admitted to the hospital for small things, then guess what? We're going to have to encourage you to get this done as an outpatient. And then the people who are going to be in the hospital are truly going to be sick. You got to imagine there's tons of barriers, uh, regulatory and, and whatnot, in order to affect any change there. But just point to Uber. They broke the uh, New York taxi medallion monopoly and got their foot in the door in a lot of other places. All of that uh, just being in the right place at the right time with the right interest rate level, which maybe we don't have anymore. Uh, cheap money kind of out the door. Uh, I We got a few minutes left here. We haven't talked about Elon much. So I want to put this uh, tweet of yours on the screen here. Anyone know what happened to the cyber truck? Um, just in general, anything on Elon you want to add to this? Now the uh, CEO of Twitter. You know, it's funny. I like five, 10 years ago, I was like a huge giant Elon Musk fan, right? Because here's a guy who is a visionary, right? Who um, pushes far forward. He doesn't take no for an answer. He, if he sees something in his head, he tries to figure out how to create it. I love that aspect of who Elon Musk is, who he is today. The billionaire Elon Musk, I'm not a fan of. Right. Because what I've noticed over time is he like over promises and under delivers. Right. I also think that he has become Icarus where he flies too close to the sun and he's at a point where like he legitimately could like blow up most of his money or melt, right? <laughs> I, or like completely melt. I mean, how do you focus on Tesla has only made what four model, four different models and five, if you count the roadster, right. That they've had on the road for mass like production. But like I drive a, a Tesla and I can tell you right now, like the quality of it, even I drive a, a model Y and the quality of it isn't where you expect that price point to be. Right. And I don't think he's like paid attention enough to realize that he hasn't a hundred percent nailed in his product before he moves on to something else. The Cybertruck was promised years ago, 
right? Same thing. He's delivered late every single time. And people let him get away with it because he's, quote, unquote, Elon Musk. He lands rockets back on um, – on the earth, which I think is phenomenal. I think SpaceX is amazing. Yes. But like he can get away with stuff because he's quote unquote Elon Musk. I mean, the boring company was supposed to build these hyperloops and all these other things. And a flamethrower. And a flame, like, and he, <laughs> like, where are these products? Right. The people forget like the government subsidized Tesla. Like he was going to go bankrupt several times and he just sort of made it out by the skin of his teeth. And people have basically put him on a golden pedestal like he can do no wrong. And now he owns Twitter. And Twitter has been a disaster for the last week since he's taken over. Like, absolute disaster. Let's not even, like, I spent a lot of time on that app. It is an <laughs> absolute dumpster fire right now. And he's basically has a a bunch of people around him who are telling him he can do no wrong. And they're all yes men. They're going to tell him exactly what he needs to hear, but he may not, he needs someone around him. I honestly don't think he has people around him who can disagree with him. And that's where I think he is. And I wish he would get back to the Elon Musk that wants to actually fix things as opposed to doing these things where he's trolling people. And honestly, it looks like he just punches down the entire time. Yeah, I mean, you watch the interview. I've watched the interviews with him where he's extremely thoughtful and responsive, and it's completely a different character than what I might see on uh, Twitter. And I, I just got to leave that topic there. As usual, I have a million follow up questions, but I want to pivot to one more thing. Uh, your family and a new addition to your home, if we can call that up on the Wi Fi Interactive one more time. And this would be your big boy right there, uh, a yeah. little terrorist, right? Um, yeah, he's, he's, uh, matter of fact, he got into the mud today and just, oh my God. <laughs> God, uh, but he's, <laughs> he's a joy. Pollock? Yeah, definitely a Jackson Pollock today and not with paint. I can tell you that right now. And it was not what I was expecting to wake up to. And your family in general. I mean, this is we do all of these things. We try to make money for to enjoy our lives and for our families. Um, how have you been able to give back to your children, um, considering what you've been through and some of the life lessons that you've learned, which have been admittedly very difficult? I try and show them that they can create and they can be whoever they want to be. Right. Like me and my wife, we talk about this is like now that they see me as a surgeon, they see all the things I do. That's just normal to them now. Right. And so all I do is raise the floor of the expectations on what they should be. Right. Like I played college basketball. I, I ran track. Like those are just normal things to them. So they're like, it's not a big deal to go do those things because guess what? My dad already did it and I know I'm going to be better than my dad. So it's easy for me to do. And I, I also want them to know the value of hard work, which is tough. Right. And I have to instill in them like stuff that I didn't necessarily get along the way because they are going to grow up differently. I was forced to learn those things. I was forced to be in those situations and, so, and life sort of made me go that direction. And so I have to be conscious about what I teach them to make sure that they understand why they're doing things, why they need to work hard each day in order to get to where they need to be. Uh, we have to leave things there. I really appreciate your time here. And I can't wait to get you uh, on our live shows just for a brief interview. Maybe we're going to be talking about who knows what we're going to be talking about because the news gives us that uh, gift every day. Uh, Dr. David Roiney, surgeon, entrepreneur, financial literacy enthusiast. Uh, really appreciate you coming in here today. And thank you to all the viewers uh, for their love for this program and for Yahoo Finance as well. We're going to see you on Twitter and also yahoofinance.com.